bets, look into convolutional neural nets. I said they have been very successful in the image recognition problem, which was a big problem for a long time. And the breakthrough, this, it's also not too long ago, in 2000 and, around 2012, these convolutional neural nets started to win all the competitions. They became better than humans in these kind of tasks of something very qualitative. Before we always thought computers, they can only do, but they cannot do something qualitative like seeing an image, appreciating the qualitative distinctive, but turns out, yeah, not too long ago, we figured that out. How can you think about that? One of the first applications is this famous data set that has a bunch of handwritten numbers. And that's what's kind of like our first competition where people tried to solve machines to recognize human written numbers back then, you know, we had checks or whatever you still had where you had human written numbers was very important. And so we have this here, we want to at the end recognize our number four, we could do supervised learning, for example, and train and you know what that is right supervised learning from the previous lecture and train the machine to recognize a number four even so it might not be exactly written in the same sense how do we do that well we feed the numbers into it and then in the input layer we make very simple distinction keep it simple keep it really simple so for example you have a neural net and then you would say like if there is one layer that detects that one pixel next to it is dark and one pixel next to it is white and then the one below it is also dark and the one below it is also dark and the one next to it is white then you basically well then you have uh, you use these neural nets in order to record that and you represent a line now the line can go this way or it can go that way but that's basically how you then represent it and it was inspired of course of how our retina as well perceives at the beginning, it just perceives, oh, there's something more dark and something more light and rudimentary eyes of, of, of a more rudimentary species also basically then do that. They distinguish between shadows and represent that in their retina. But then you can go deeper. That's where the deep learning is coming from into the hidden layers and process something else. For example, it could be that these distinctions actually go horizontally and vertically in a nine degree angle. And then you have a cross or they kind of like go around and slowly but surely start to create a circle. And a circle is also just representation of dots. Think about in a digital, digital display, how numbers are represented with, with pixels for example. And so you now you can recognize circles and crosses. Oh, you recognize that. It's kind of like the, the naive idea that we had. There's a grandmother cell in our brain that recognizes the grandmother. And it's a little bit like that. Because you go further into it, you scale it up. And now you can recognize grandmothers. Well, not there, not th but more advanced neural nets would do that. And now you can have different figures here. And you can say, okay, so we have this construction, which is kind of like there's a round and there's a cross in it. But is it a four? Or is it a nine? Not sure. So we now here would compute the output, but usually neural nets don't do that immediately. So they're not only forward, feed forward networks. Often they do that for the first time, but it turned out that it was not very useful. If we would do that and said like first feed forward and then we would say like, oh yeah, it's a four, we are done. That didn't go so well. So what, what was a big insight was we should work more with probabilities. So we would go through there and estimate how likely is it that it's actually a line? How likely is it that it's a cross and it's a circle? How likely is that? And then if we come to a decision like this, is this a four and a nine? And you do not know. And even as a human, you might not know <laughs> if it's a four or a nine. We give it a probability. And the good thing is to keep the probability slightly apart, but not too much. So I'm exaggerating here and I get, probably get a lot of heat of simplifying things like this here. But you could say at the end, like, okay, give it a 51% for a four and a 49% for a nine. And then what you do is you go backwards. So that's the back propagation algorithm, the famous back propagation algorithm that then goes backwards. And then basically calculates how much would a small change in each weight of these neurons affect the loss or the reward. That's the matching basically of the number with the four. And we do that with, I don't know if you recognize that equation here, but that's, yeah, that's the good old chain rule from calculus. You, surely ran into it in high school calculus that was mentioned. I mean, that's from Gottfried Leibniz. That's from 1600, what, 60 or something? So this stuff is cutting edge. No, no, it's 1600, 60, whatever, five. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz calculus, the chain rule. And that's how we do this back propagation business. So we basically run the entire thing backwards. The back propagation is also then. Now we discovered that it's actually efficient and it's beneficial to do 
neural nets, design neural nets differently than brains. Final judgment is not out, but for everything we know for now, and, and, and what they say is that the brain very unlikely does back, back propagation in the same way that artificial neural nets do. Why? Do we have that suspicion? Because in order to do this back, back propagation, you need to understand the entire system as a whole in order to calculate your loss and your reward in this chain rule of calculus. And the brain, we haven't discovered that it has a complete comprehensive understanding of what's going on. It's usually locally. There's the Hebbian rule and there's some local what, wires together, fire, what fires together, wires together. And it's more like locally, it doesn't have some control center where it calculates the average over the entire neural net. But that's what we do at least here. So that's a difference. The brain doesn't do back propagation, at least not in that sense that we do in artificial neural nets. And it turned out this back propagation thing is extremely powerful. Whoa, is that powerful? And it solved a lot of issues. And it used, it's used in many modern machine learning applications. 